from Philharmonic Hall in Lincoln Center, home of the world's greatest musical events, another program of New York Philharmonic Young People's Concerts with Leonard Bernstein. This special program is being brought to you by Polaroid Corporation. And here is Mr. Bernstein. I guess you all recognize that hit tune. It's uh, on every jukebox. It's the background for endless TV commercials. It's the in-joke of the film world, the music of the future of the space age, the theme song of the Milky Way. But what is it really? Well, it's the opening minute or so of a remarkable tone poem by Richard Strauss called Thus Spake Zarathustra. Okay, so you know that opening fanfare, but who among you knows any of the thousands of notes that make up the remaining half hour of this extraordinary piece? Aha! Well, that's what we're into on today's program. And by the end of it, you're going to wind up experts on Zarathustra. All right, first things first. Who was Zarathustra and what did he spake? Well, he was a Persian prophet of the 6th century BC who was known also by the Greek name of Zoroaster and who founded a religion called Zoroastrianism. Now, it's a long way from 500 BC to Richard Strauss who wrote his Zarathustra tone poem in 1896 AD, a mere 75 years ago. So what's the connection? Well, the connection is a German philosopher named Nietzsche I'm sorry about all these names, but they're necessary if we're going to make sense of this. Friedrich Nietzsche, a highly poetic philosopher who was all the rage in Germany when Strauss was a young man. And along with everyone else at the time, Strauss was fascinated by the strange and sometimes shocking utterances that came out of Nietzsche, particularly in one wildly rhapsodic book called Thus Spake Zarathustra, which isn't really about the prophet Zarathustra at all. Nietzsche simply used Zarathustra as a spokesman, a sort of prophet hero, into whose mouth he put his own philosophy. And that philosophy 
had much more to do with the brand new theory of evolution than with any prophet or religion at all. In fact, Nietzsche was quite opposed to religion in general, if you want to know the absolute truth, because his Zarathustra preaches the evolution of man by the process of natural selection, as Darwin put it, the survival of the fittest, the constant growth of the human race from the ape of long ago to the superman of the future. In other words, Nietzsche is saying that man as we know him now is not the child of God, but only a bridge leading from the beast he was to the God he will become. I teach you the superman, Nietzsche shouts in the voice of Zarathustra. Well, he may, but I don't. I teach you a piece of music by Richard Strauss. Now, Strauss's Zarathustra is a picture of man's greatest problem, which is the problem of his mortality, the grim fact that one way or another he must eventually die. He's mortal. And this painful problem is shown in terms of a conflict, the struggle between man's tremendous need for immortality and his equally strong need to accept the fact that he is mortal. It's a struggle we all share. Perhaps a, a better way of saying it is that it's a conflict between the natural universe, which is eternal, and man, who isn't. And this conflict is what Strauss's music is all about in musical terms, the struggle between one key and another, between one theme and another, between major and minor, between music that lifts us up and music that presses us down. Take your hit tune, for example, right at the beginning. Now that's going up for sure, and it's clearly in the key of C, right? Good old C. No sharps or flats, all white keys, no problem everything bright and clear. And that's why Strauss builds his introduction on that rising motive, because it's supposed to depict a glorious sunrise, the equivalent of the prologue in Nietzsche's poem in which Zarathustra greets the morning sun on his mountaintop. But with the rising sun arises the first conflict, which is this. That's the conflict of major and minor. You see, those famous three notes are in C, all right, but they are neither major nor minor. They could be either one. And now Strauss poses the first question, which is it, major or minor? And then again, again come the same three notes, louder. And again the question, only this time the other way around, minor or major? In other words, it's as if Strauss were saying, okay, that's the sun, the solar system, the universe, perfect and everlasting. But what's my relation to it? If I'm part of it all, which I am, then why am I not also perfect and everlasting and immortal? And that's the first question to be asked in this work, which is one long series of questions from start to finish. And the finish, as you'll see, instead of being an answer, will be the strangest and spookiest question of all. But Let's go back to the prologue. Having just heard the sun come up in radiant C major, we are now presented with our second conflict, which is a new key. See, after that staggering organ chord you heard, there is some murky shuffling around in the dark regions of the orchestra, and out of it emerges a new theme in the new key of B minor. And this is the way the theme goes. Now that would represent in its first tentative form the spirit of mortal man striving up, <laughs> striving up to cut loose from his mortal bonds. Now that key of B is as close as you can get to the original key of C, isn't it? They're right together. And that's just what makes the difference between them so poignant, that they're so near and yet so far. In other words, Man feels in his hopes and dreams so close to immortality, and yet it just manages to elude him. And so it is with C major and B minor. They're practically touching, but they're light years apart. Of course, we're also going to hear this new striving theme eventually in B major, as well as B minor. 
So we see a new conflict established, just as we saw between C major and C minor. It's a conflict within a conflict, in other words. First we have the opposing pair of keys, C and B, and then within each of those keys, the opposing modes of major and minor. Wow, that's difficult stuff, isn't it? But the worst is over, because from now on, the whole piece can be understood in terms of these conflicts as a series of man's attempts to break, break through the fences of his mortality. Now, these attempts in the music are in the form of eight chapters which Strauss selected from the 80 chapters of Nietzsche's book. And now having been through the prologue, we've arrived at chapter one, which is called The Men of the Primitive World, that is, primitive man's attempt to solve the problem. And he doesn't mean prehistoric man. He means the primitive man that exists subconsciously in each of us. And this primitive solution, according to Nietzsche, is the one of religion. And so we promptly hear the old church melody of the credo intoned by the French horns. Credo in unum Deo. And this represents strict religious dogma, as does the organ a bit later, playing the church melody of Magnificat. Magnificat. And in between these chants, the strings build up a lush section of religious comfort and ecstasy, which is, however, doomed to dissolve in doubt and dissonance. How's that for Agnew alliteration? Doomed to dissolve in doubt and dissonance. Wow. Uh, but it's as if Strauss is trying to say that religion is okay for the backward and the primitive, but not for the supermen we are destined to be. Perfected man will not need God. Well, that's highly debatable. But it does result in some beautiful religious music for the orchestra. In fact, so beautiful that it almost destroys Strauss's argument that the religious solution is a failure. And so, on to chapter two, man tries again. Again, he strives upward in B minor. Only this time, he manages to achieve B major. if only for a brief moment. For again he is confronted by the merciless glare of eternity. Those opening three notes, remember? And now he's trapped between that nature theme and the religious music. And like a wild animal, he springs up in resistance with this typically Straussian outburst. And this is the main content of this second chapter which is called the great yearning, that wild motive of resistance fighting against the religious chanting on the one hand and eternity on the other. And all this battling mounts in intensity, hurling us into chapter three, which is entitled Joys and Passions. And this new attempt to solve the problem is through pure physical joy and passion. But at the height of that passionate chapter, there blares out in the trombones a whole new grotesque motive, which blows the whole thing apart, like this. Now that ugly sort of motive is known as the theme of rejection or disgust. And that's the third and last theme I'll ask you to remember. There's the nature motive in C, which you know anyway from the commercials. And there's the striving theme, right, in B, and this rejection motive. Now, the weird quality of that last one comes from the fact that it's related to both keys of C and B. So it's really in neither key. In fact, it's in no key at all. And that's what makes it say, I reject. I reject all keys, major and minor. I reject this whole solution of passion, all the solutions so far. And so in disgust, this chapter melts away into chapter four, which is called the grave song, where we're forced back into our mortal B minor and into a tangle of counterpoint in which all the themes are pressed together into a dense, gloomy mass 
that weighs us down and down as though there's no solution. It's like man sinking into a pit of despair. Now, for reasons of time, you're not going to hear that chapter today, uh, you lucky people, because it's very depressing. But I wanted you to know about it anyway because the point is that man never gives up. At the very bottom, where he can sink no lower, he starts a new attempt, chapter 5, which is the solution of science. Now, for Strauss, the perfect musical picture of science and learning was obviously the fugue, the dry, formal, academic fugue. And this fugue takes place mainly in the very low bottom of the pit regions of the orchestra, in the cellos and basses. And the subject of this fugue is an amazing one. It begins with those famous three notes in C, but then goes on to include all the 12 tones that exist in music. This may not seem so amazing these days, but in 1896, believe me, it was a shocker. Listen, it goes like this. That's really modern music and very mysterious, isn't it? Makes a fascinating sound groaning away down there in the bowels of the orchestra. And so the fugue grinds along, getting absolutely nowhere, but man still doesn't give up. A new burst of spirit brings us to chapter six, in which that science fugue, egged on by a furious version of the rejection motive, develops altogether into a creature of monstrous energy, ending in a huge climax for the full orchestra and organ, peeling out the three great notes of the very beginning, the fanfare of the sun. And this chapter is called The Convalescent and corresponds to Zarathustra's crisis in Nietzsche's book, where he has a complete breakdown out of disgust, rejection, and frustration, and goes into a coma out of which he emerges a new man who finally sees the light, the way to attaining the Superman. Now, this is the halfway mark of Strauss's mighty work, and I think it's a good place for us to break, too. Uh, you've had more than enough to digest so far. So let's now hear the music up to this point, uh, starting back at that great organ chord where we left off.
left Zarathustra alive but not well uh, after his nervous breakdown, screaming out his immortality in C major, as you just heard. And now his recovery begins with all the old conflicts, gloomy B minor again, and more striving of the spirit, and more groans of rejection and disgust. And finally, the striving again, but this time, striving with such a superhuman effort and with such a new recharged battery that he makes it at last to the upper regions, to the highest reaches of outer space. And that's where the convalescent Zarathustra has finally arrived by sheer will and spirit out of his sick bed. And that mad scream on the trumpet <laughs> that you just heard is, of course, the crowing of the cock, announcing the dawning of the new day, the super age, the age of the Superman. And so suddenly, Strauss's piece has turned into a ball, a gas, high, high with cocks crowing and the stratosphere trilling away, planets whirling and space rushing by, all in maniacal good humor. Even the old rejection theme is now a loony laugh. And altogether, mounting higher and higher, the music culminates in the great dance song, which is chapter seven, the dance of Superman in all his glory. And of course, needless to say, in C major. Now we're really spaced out in this tone poem, and what does Superman's dance have to be? Well, you know, you've all been to the movies, a Viennese waltz, of course, right? And this one is, believe me, a super waltz. I won't give you any examples of it because it's such fun, it's so easy, tuneful, and lilting that you'll get it immediately. But as it spins on to its reeling climax, all the themes of the piece are gathered up by it and waltzed dizzily around. It's a frenzied buildup, and at this second and final great climax of the work, an enormous bell chimes midnight, 12 strokes, as the rejection motive takes over the scene in full power. And with that, the whole C major bubble bursts, the dream crashes, the stars come crashing down, bringing Superman with them, tumbling down, floating down, quieter and quieter, until at last we slip, as if by magic, into a suddenly peaceful B major. And this is the eighth and final chapter called The Night Wanderer's Song, in which apparently man, or Zarathustra, or Strauss, comes to terms with himself, accepts his mortality, and finds peace. Now you notice I said that this peaceful coda is in the key of B, which is man's mortal key, but it's B major, not minor. In other words, the major achievement of all human striving, which is final serenity. But you may also notice that I said apparently man has found peace. Because as I told you earlier, Strauss's work does not end with a comforting answer, but with a very spooky question. And to ask this question, Strauss has written one of the most extraordinary endings in the history of music. Now listen closely. That B major music of peace and acceptance rises slowly to heavenly heights. And just when we're there, and we think everything's settled and comfortable, there appears way down in the bass, very softly, those terrifying three notes of the opening in their unshakable original key of C major. 
those notes that remind us of eternity, of immortality. So up here in B major, man is resigned and peaceful. And down here, nature is nagging at him, teasing him with immortality in C major. Up here, all is serene acceptance. Down here, our Superman dream won't let us rest. Up here, we accept mortality. Down here, we reject it. We say yes. We say no. Life. Death. Or perhaps it's death and life. But whichever it is, there's no more music. That's the end of the piece. An unsolved riddle in two keys. But what a try for a solution. What a gigantic effort this work of Strauss represents. The inspiration is so great and the music so fascinating and masterful that whatever the super answer may be, we come out of listening to this music wiser and better people than we were before. Now here are the marvelous final chapters of Thus Spake Zarathustra. And by the way, because the ending is so strange and mystical, you may not feel like applauding. So don't feel you have to, unless of course you really want to.
From Philharmonic Hall in Lincoln Center, another New York Philharmonic Young People's Concert, under the musical direction of Leonard Bernstein, as presented, Thus Spake Richard Strauss. Heard in today's program was Strauss's tone poem, Thus Spake Zarathustra. The next concert in this series will be broadcast on May 23rd with Dean Dixon as guest conductor. This program was recorded in Philharmonic Hall and was produced and directed by Roger Englander. This special program has been brought to you by Polaroid Corporation and by the Kitchens of Sarah Lee.